solidarity weekend retreat for, uh, for the undergraduate students. It's actually a, a leadership retreat. It's going to be February uh, 22nd through the 23rd in the day of the bay. So any undergraduate students who are interested in joining the, uh, the, uh, the leadership retreat, please uh, see Sophia there or um, uh, our staff, Rajit uh, Man, or Gosi Shema, uh, Shema uh, Kuber in the uh, Mesa office. We are very pleased that this leadership retreat is actually funded by the Fair Studies, Studies uh, uh, program as well as getting administrative support within the university. So that's coming up immediately. And then February 10th, which is just right around the corner, we have uh, Karima Benun, who is the new faculty in the uh, School of Law. And she's giving a talk entitled Sidi Muzi uh, Blues and the Green Wave Journey Through the Air Spring and Fall. And that's going to be at the conference center. Um, and again, like, like this, there'll be a reception at 6 p.m. and a lecture visit at 7 uh, p.m. And then we're very fortunate also to have in uh, February um, Fatma Sadiqi, who is a leading feminist uh, theorist from Morocco. Uh, she will be talking about women's rights in Morocco and the 2011 constitution that, uh, that came as a result of the Arab Spring. Um, and that will be also, that February 20th, it also be 6 p.m. reception and 7 p.m. lecture. That's here in this, in this building. And then, uh, uh, heads up uh, quite in advance, in May we have two very important events we want to uh, uh, and put you on, on your calendar. One specifically for undergraduates, it's our first annual undergraduate Arab Studies Conference. And uh, that will be uh, an opportunity, it's uh, May 16th, for students who are involved in Arab studies in any way, who are interested in sharing their research, their thoughts, their reflections, their art, their music. We would be we welcome many different types of presentations. So please make sure that you see Shana Kuber, see me, or see Kujitma to uh, uh, submit your proposal. There's actually going to be a review process. Uh, and then the, those papers that were accepted or those presentations, because they won't be just papers presented, will be notified in May. Uh, and there, there will be an all day event, uh, there will be a lunch and a dinner. And uh, for that particular uh, event, we have uh, in our audience the gentleman who we are dead, uh, Mr. Rita Saleh, and his wife, Mona Saleh, who came up with the idea. It was not our idea, it was his idea, their idea. And uh, they are raising all the funds to pay for this conference. It's a wonderful opportunity for undergraduate students. So, and if you do any paper that you're, that you're looking for in a class or a presentation that you're, uh, that you're uh, developing for yourself outside of class, so come see us. We really want to support undergraduate uh, students doing Arab studies. And then the last one announcement I want to make is uh, our first Arab studies conference. It's going to be May 2nd and 3rd. On May 2nd, the conference will be uh, Subjectivities and its Discontents, and May 3rd will be Decolonization and its Discontents. And we have distinguished scholars from coming from all over the country, and actually some of from outside the country, for that two-day conference, and we really want to encourage you to join us. And that, too, is part of the Fair Society um, uh, program in Arab Studies. Um, it's my pleasure this evening to welcome a very dear friend, Professor Bedra Shadun Kadorkian. Professor Shadun Kadorkian is a senior PhD at the Institute of Criminology uh, and Law in the Faculty of Law at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. Uh, in law, she's had, she has a current appointment as Associate Professor in the Institute of Criminology, Faculty of Law, uh, and the School of Social Work and Social Welfare at Hebrew University. She has been a visiting professor at the Faculty of Law at Georgetown University, one of our leading schools of law in the country. She's been a visiting professor uh, of the Faculty of Law at the University of California, Los Angeles, UCLA. She's been a visiting professor of the Faculty of Law at the University of Southern California. Uh, she has won many, many prizes and awards. Uh, just, she received the, in 2011, the Distinguished Award in the Field of Law and Society. Uh, International Scholarship Prize, the, the Women's Rights Prize from the Peter and Patricia Hoover Foundation.
Association, a phenomenal woman award <laughs> from Catholic State University in Northridge, the Golden Knight Year Fellowship from Hebrew University in Jerusalem. Uh, she has um, been chair of the uh, Air Ad Hoc Committee for Higher Education and Council of Higher Education in Jerusalem. Uh, she has been a leader in training judges and uh, uh, rape crisis workers uh, in, uh, in uh, Israel and Palestine. She established the first hotline for abused Palestinian women, uh, actually the first hotline for abused women in the Arab world, uh, and continues to uh, support that uh, activity. Uh, she, her list of grants goes on for pages or pages but just to mention a few, a grant from the Henry Luce Foundation, the U.S. Institute for Peace, the Israeli Internet Association, uh, grants from the Women for uh, Women's Rights Group, the Pitts Foundation, the Ford Foundation, the Conrad Adenauer uh, Foundation, the World Health Organization, the UNIFEM, uh, just uh, an impressive degree, uh, an impressive list of grants uh, awarded uh, and uh, an indication of how well respected She has uh, published four books, just to mention the most recent, Militarization and Violence Against Women in the Conflict Zones, a Palestinian Case Study, and uh, another book, Women in Political Conflict, the Case of Palestinian Women in Jerusalem. That's only two of her four books. She has an edition eight monographs, an edited book, over 100 book chapters and, and articles. Uh, it would take the rest of the evening to, uh, to list all of her Achievements. But tonight she's going to share with us a specific research project that she's been working on. Uh, the title of her talk is Criminality in Spaces of Death, the Palestinian Case Study. Please join me in welcoming Professor Nathalie Shabuka. Talking about death and criminality in spaces of death is a bit hard to comprehend, but this is a topic that I'm researching for the past five, six years. And I started the research looking at more at the cycle social reaction to loss and death in occupied East Jerusalem and moved into looking at other aspects of. Uh, death in Jerusalem. But let me just remind you that only yesterday, for those of you who heard the news, only yesterday Palestinian dead bodies were returned to their uh, families. And um, there's something called um, the, the graveyard that is called the graveyard of numbers. There are num numbers of Palestinian dead bodies that are buried there. And Israel have refused to return them to their parents, to their families. And yesterday, one of the families received, after 2002, their son was uh, killed, received the body. So the issue of death and dying is not uh, a new issue in Palestine. But understanding the dimensions of Israeli colonial occupation in East Jerusalem, especially in relation to death, requires really an inquiry into the everyday modes of oppression, along with concentration of the larger themes of historical domination and structural control in Palestine. 
Palestinian death, graveyards, death rituals, and bereavement ceremonies in East Jerusalem constitute meaningful yet often overlooked sites of critical analysis. These sites of death offer a unique context for exploring the potential dialogue between the dead, the settler colonial regime, and crime of the settler colonial regime, mainly the state crime, in order to reveal the everyday workings of power, where the Palestinian dead are located, as well as the access that the living have to these spaces. And everything is marked by the conflict and by the criminality of the settler colonial regime. Dialoguing with the dead and the dead as this presentation hopes to do, challenge the Israeli state's effort to silence Palestinian humanity, specifically focusing on the dead. As colonized societies around the world struggle to reclaim their histories and articulate the complexity of their political resistance against a tradition of inter intellectual power, the Eurocentric settler colonial narrative of suffering intervenes and rewrite some of these selected stories. Somehow I always think why Palestinian suffering is not acknowledged, why other people's suffering is always looked at, defined, respected, recognized, but Palestinian suffering is always evicted from even the trauma genre. These rewriting, and, and, this, is, and this is so important, these rewriting negate the voices, struggles and suffering of the other right relying on an individualizing produ production of knowledge that further culturalizes and historicizes and apoliticizes suffering. One such sign of colonial suffering and resistance mediated through the and manipulated by global racial politics is the Israeli settler colonial encounter in Palestinian spaces of death. Palestinian spaces of death and dying in East Jerusalem uniquely capture this colonial dynamic while allowing for a reading of unrecognized modes of collective and everyday resistance. By focusing on the violence imposed over Palestinian dead bodies and local Palestinian cemeteries, my talk hopes to uncover how settler colonial regime and settler colonialism create spaces of death for the living Palestinians. And I will show you how spaces of death are created in living spaces. And in doing so, I will share with you some of the uh, graphics that an organization called Tag Mechir Price Tag is conducting. It's a settler colonial group that is invading Palestinian spaces and so on. Second, it builds structures of power to expel the colonized not only from living spaces, but also from spaces of mourning, as well as sites of death. And third, maintain violent conditions that invade the mere spaces and times of death and loss, as reflected in the narrative that I will be sharing, in addition to the newly enacted, enacted Nakba law that is imposing surveillance over the mere memory of the Palestinians. Now, my analysis of colonial suffering in death is guided by interview material I gathered from 32 Palestinian families who had lost loved ones in East Jerusalem between 2009 to 2013. And my talk will advance three primary arguments. Number one, the history and present conditions of the Palestinian demonstrate that their humanity was and is negated, and their eraser as people was and is derived by the settler colonial logic of elimination as Patrick Wolf would call it. And this is embedded in three central interlocking forces, the European, which is primarily British colonial power, the Zionist settler colonial movement, and the justificatory biblical narrative that privileges the chosen people uh, above all others. Second, in order to maintain a continuous system of negation and eraser, early Zionists and later the Jewish state have developed an assemblage of laws, policies, narratives, symbols, and practices that rename the trauma and suffering of the dispossessed with colonial terminology, classifying Palestinians as
as invaders. If you look at what happened in the, during the 1948 when they prevented Palestinians from coming back to their homes, and there was, uh, and, and the people that tried to come back to their homes were called infiltrators. So this set of, this assemblage of different laws that started calling the indigenous, the native, as an invader, while the settler, or indigenizing the settler, as Lorenzo Perucini would uh, call it, or using the laws that are uh, present absentee, calling as a security threats, or demographic threats. Under this analytical apparatus, I will be sharing with you a court decision that examined a graveyard in uh, occupied East Jerusalem. And third, despite the denial and constant eviction and displacement of the continuous Nakba, Palestinian in life, as in death, Palestinian resistance and agency continues against preserving them as present absentees, present as terrorist others, but kept absent, or as Andrea Smith would call it, maintained in a constant state of disappearing. So I will try to play with those three ideas uh, together. Nohad. Nohad narrative following the loss of her husband, Ismail. My husband was in prison, and he suffered a lot and was hoping to be released earlier. In his last days before he died, he was very sick, and he wanted to be with us before it was too late. But Simon, the prison guard, told him that he would leave prison only in a black bag as a dead body. The nurse in the hospital told my husband that he could file a complaint against the prison guard, and he did, but he died four days later. When they sent us his body, I wanted it to free. Out of the black bag, the one that they used to wrap dead prisoners. I knew what he wanted us to do. I knew he wanted us to see me and tell me he is free now. When he was in prison, he was worried that when he would be released, he wouldn't be able to handle the heat in our house. So I told him that we managed to buy a small air conditioner and he would be released and enjoy the room very much. And they live in a refugee camp in Jerusalem. So when he died, we washed him and wrapped him in a white shroud. I saw his face. He was happy that it's not that black bag. I told them all that he wanted to be in the air conditioning room, and we brought him and let him enjoy the room. We all stayed with him there and enjoyed him, and he was happy. He even squeezed my hand to express his content. The entire society, everybody, came to see him in that nice room, as if he was really alive and free. Now, Nohat's narrative tells a different story. Her voice reveals the way in which the power of the dead body was furthered by the family and community practices of giving his body and their society life and agency in the face of death. The making of new meaning of such loss. The positive outlook, the building of hope and the spirituality it carries can be seen as an expression of the community's ability to speak back to colonial power. The death of Ismail and the acts of Nohad and the community contrasted with the violent interaction and rhetoric of the prison guard, Simon, reveals how one party wants to enliven the dead through the use of the dead body and its barrier as a political act of resistance. And she did. She brought him and she kept on saying, I, I brought him to the air-conditioned room. I made him feel the fact that no, he is not now in the black bag, but rather in the white coffin in the house. Even though Ismail was deprived of the ability to bear witness to his own freedom from incarceration, even though society failed to celebrate his life. The meaning he, his released dead body carried when the black bag was exchanged for a white shroud and the temporal stability and sense of connectedness it brought to the family, if only for a while, and lived his dead body and the community, as Nohad related. 
When we managed to get him home, all the people came, political leaders, Abu Mazen, Mahmoud Abbas, the head of the Palestinian Authority came, assistants, representatives of political parties, and many people I had never met. The community cooked and fed all the mourners. I felt that some people were even jealous that he got so much attention and was so loved and respected. His death and his loss made them all want to continue his struggle, his cause, his aim. They all promised that this, his death would push all Palestinians to never surrender. This is exactly what he wanted, what he told us. His death was filled with hope and power. You could feel it in the air, in the number of participants in the house. Even when the military told us that we should bury him at night, they made my son sign a paper committing us to bury him at night. Even then, I heard, I heard him. Yes, I heard him asking me not to allow them to do so. He wanted to be buried in the sun, in the daylight. I told my son, and he asked the politicians to respect his father's wishes to be buried in daylight. The whole community walked with us. His funeral was like a wedding, very big, very respectful. Ismail spoke not out of, or not only by proxies. Dialogue between Nohad and her dead husband and, her, and his community created a new transversal space for the community from ending, endings in death to a future life. The fact that Nohad and her community lack a secure speaking position turned death into a means to claim a new space in life. The impossibility of speaking was turned into a space for the community to talk back. The dead body is thus an active social agent, and as such, it comes back to life. Now, to further understand what goes on and the control over Palestinians' lives, to further understand the reading and the writing of the living power of the Palestinian dead body, uh, let me first take you on a journey and share with you some general data. For one can't read life, and you could never understand life, and understand the struggle, and understand death without comprehending the context, the surveillance and control over Palestinian uh, living at that point. Let me start a little bit with demography because the main argument is that we Palestinian Palestinians are a demographic threat. According to the plans, the Israeli plan is to have 70% of Jerusalem uh, Jewish and 30% Arab. Actual statistics today, uh, Palestinians are 38% and this is according to the Israeli Civil Rights Association. The main aim is to Judaize the space, yeah? What um, some scholars would call spatiocide. So look at what goes on on geopolitical uh, uh, analysis. We have the wall, and the wall have evicted 55,000 Palestinians out of Jerusalem. There is 130,000 Palestinians affected 3.7 million from the West Bank and Gaza are separated. In addition, there are checkpoints. 16 checkpoints are there. We, there is the permit system that is purely a legal system to control and displace Palestinians. There is land confiscation and there's a de-housing demolition. Just look at the land and the zoning um, uh, in Jerusalem. So you could see as, uh, it shows that 35% of the land is expropriated by, for Israeli settlement. And I, I have added today, only after a talk with Sarah, uh, a map just to, to show you exactly what goes on. So 35% is expropriated for Israeli settlement. 13% is zoned for Palestinian construction. Unplanned 30%, which means we cannot use it even if it's, it belongs to Palestinian. And 22% uh, is considered zones of a green land. And I will very soon show you the map. In addition, housing demolitions. 
The main, aim, the main claim is that Palestinians are building without permits. Now, according to the is, is statistics by Israel, is 94% rejection of those that are filing asking for a permit. 